The lands of Canaan were frequently fought over by the major powers of the Bronze Age, and just because they didn't have an empire of their own doesn't mean that they were poor warriors. That's far from the truth. Capable fighters were found both in the rich city-states and more rural parts of Canaan. But what do we know about late Bronze Age warfare in these lands? What were the warriors equipped with and what was their military organization? That's something we'll figure out in this episode dedicated to the land of honey, war and wine. While we are missing some key pieces of the Canaanite puzzle, thanks to the rich archaeological findings at Ras Shamra, the ancient kingdom of Ugarit, we can mostly reconstruct the equipment and organization of most of the small kingdoms and some city-states of the late Bronze Age. Canaan was the crossroads of the Middle East. The equipment was as varied as the people they went through and Canaanite metalsmiths were some of the best in the world. Canaanite shields came in several varieties. We had smaller wooden round shields and rectangular shields covered with hide and the nobility would have some decorations on them. Also, we find larger wooden or wicker shields depending on the region. One interesting fact about the Phoenician shields during antiquity. Phoenician mercenaries were recruited in large amounts by big powers such as the Persians and they were using equipment identical to the Greeks with one important difference. Instead of the Oplon shield, some accounts of Phoenician shields describe them as being completely round, a tradition kept from the old times. When it comes to armor, it all varies by region and wealth, so if you were a drafted levy from the farmlands, yeah, padded cloth is probably the best case scenario for you. Raiders, merchants and mercenaries had an easier time acquiring better quality leather armor with some bronze scales of both Canaanite and Mesopotamian design. In the richer city-states and kingdoms, as we have documented from Ugarit, the higher-ranking nobility would be provided full-scale and lamellar bronze armor from the royal supplies and in some cases, lesser nobles and wealthy citizens would purchase their own equipment. Scale armor was introduced by the Hurrians around the 17th century BC and thanks to the Kingdom of Mitanni, it spread like wildfire over the Middle East. To those who could afford it. Even the earliest Egyptian chariot bowmen were armored with Canaanite inspired heavy armor before they made their own lighter design. Helmets could be made with either padded cloth, hide, or if you're lucky or rich enough, actual bronze helmets. We even have depictions of Canaanite tributes sent to Egypt in the form of bronze helmets. And now, moving on to the weapons, so let's start with all reliable, the spear. You know it, you love it, and just about every army that's ever existed on this planet during ancient times would have a massive infantry equipped with spears. Why? Well, they're easy to use, they have great reach, and they're extremely cost efficient when it comes to production. Now, there's nothing revolutionary about the spears in Canaan during this time frame. When it comes to javelins, we do have a large number of archaeological findings, so that does indicate high quantities. Now, when it comes to professional infantry, we don't have exact numbers. Like for ancient Egypt, the New Kingdom, we know that pretty much all professional foot soldiers had throwing weapons, but we don't exactly know the specifics about the Canaanites here. And now here's the tricky thing about maces. We have archaeological evidence of copper maces during the, <laughs> surprise surprise, copper age and early bronze age in Canaan. But we don't really have many examples of the late bronze age. However, a tablet from Ugarit specifically mentions clubs as Marianu chariot warrior equipment and there is absolutely no way the highest ranking elite soldiers of such a rich kingdom would have a simple wooden club. It's logical to assume there would have still been metal maces and we can even find inspiration nearby. Canaan was one of the major trading hubs of the known world. It would be zero surprise to find the Mesopotamian or Elamite style weapons in their ranks such as maces which are from a similar late Bronze Age to transitionary Iron Age period. So something like this was definitely possible. The weaponsmiths of Canaan were renowned throughout the world, and what is a more beautiful weapon than a sword? 
Okay, uh, yeah, probably there's something better, but moving on. Long swords similar to blades found across the Aegean and Anatolia were forged in Ugarit and sold to Egypt, where pharaohs such as Merneptah would have their personal symbols engraved on them. This design was decent for cutting and effective at piercing armor, although the infamous Nawet two type swords brought in by the Sea People mercenaries and, unfortunately, later invaders, were even more effective at penetrating metal armor, thanks to his design. Sadly, this blade type fell out of use, even amongst the Philistine descendants of the Sea People eventually. Short swords also existed, and similar types persisted well into the Iron Age. And how can we talk about swords but not mention the ancestor of the Kopesh, the Sickle Sword? Originating in Mesopotamia, it quickly spread across Canaan and we see many different versions, especially in Egypt as the Kopesh branched off into its own, slightly more unique design. The Canaanite Sickle Sword was a brutal slashing weapon against lightly armored enemies, but its armor piercing was very, very limited. If the tip was sharpened, it would make for a pretty painful dev though, and I promise I'm not talking from first-hand experience. Perfectly preserved Kopesh swords are pretty rare in the overall archaeological track, but we do find some Egyptian ones in Canaan, probably remnants of garrison troops and higher-ranking officials, but I don't think it's impossible to assume that a Canaanite could somehow get his hands on one of these bad boys. Canaan has seen its fair share of axe evolution. Early copper axe heads eventually turn into the so-called duckbill axes that were very popular in the Middle Bronze Age, but they too would also be replaced. Epsilon axes could be found anywhere from Greece to Mesopotamia, as they were cheap to make and easy to use, but they were nowhere near as effective at armor penetration compared to other axes of the time. They were great as a cheap slashing weapon if you needed to equip a lot of soldiers, and later on we would get a heavier head type which did have better armor pen, but because of some of these heads there's also a limited evidence of potential two-handed usage, amongst other things. Axes with a narrower pick type of head were also in use. This axe type was very popular in the Zagros Mountains, Elam and Mesopotamia, so it's no surprise that it also found its way into Canaan, in some different versions. Both native and foreign axe designs are found all over Canaan, with specific armor-piercing heads and even Egyptian-style axes are present and they were not restricted only to garrison troops. Daggers were used as backup weapons and they were made either from bronze or copper if you were unlucky enough. We have a lot of examples of knives and daggers from the late Bronze Age and Middle Bronze Age of Canaan and a lot of them show battle wear and resharpening. Slings were in great use, especially amongst the nomadic cattle herders as one can imagine, versatile, cheap and deadly once you're skilled with them. Ammunition varied from rocks to baked clay and, believe it or not, bronze ammo, like this example from Cyprus, the kingdom of Alasia, famous for its copper. Composite bows were deadly weapons in skilled hands, and throughout the Bronze Age and even into later historical periods, we hear the skill of Syrian archers, or Phoenician city-states in Ugarit were so rich that they could equip entire regiments with this devastating weapon. It could have an effective range of 250 to 300 meters, and it was capable of penetrating even the scale armor of the Marianuk. It was an expensive weapon formed by layering horn, wood, sinew and gluing all the parts together. And despite popular belief with maintenance, it's able to survive very harsh conditions. The Canaanites introduced the composite bow to Egypt when the Ixos invaded and it was so highly valued that later on, Egyptians would ask for composite bows, amongst other things, as tribute from the Canaanites. Weaker self bows were also in use by poor nomadic tribesmen and farmers. And leaving the last, shocking part of the Canaanite armies, the chariots. While they were present in Canaan for a few centuries as a weapon of war, thanks to the Kingdom of Mitanni, the Marianu noble system of chariot warriors spread like wildfire across Canaan. Skilled fighter with bows, javelins and spears, they would either skirmish the enemy to death or charge disorganized and terrified infantry and devastate them. 
Equipped fully in scale armor, the Marinu were a sight to behold, and if you want to learn more about chariot warfare in the Bronze Age, I got the perfect video for you right here. So we've seen most of the weapons and armor that were in use in Canaan during the late Bronze Age, but what do we know about army organization? Canaan was a land of many peoples and, as you can imagine, there was some difference with the way they were organized. We don't have a clear picture on the nomadic tribes of the time, but we know the different Alamu groups such as the Sutans or some Arameans usually didn't have kings. They were ruled by grandmasters or a tribal council, however, there are always exceptions to the rule. When it comes to kingdoms and city-states, once again, thanks to the tablets found in Ugarit, written in both Akkadian, Ugaritic and some Hurrian, we have a decent idea on kingdoms and city-state armies. Some military terms are still not fully translated even though it's been so many decades or understood in a broader sense, but here are some certain facts. At the top of the food chain we have the king, some would personally lead campaigns, some would let the friend of the king lead. King's companions were usually high-ranking nobles gifted with special privileges and the highest quality equipment money could buy. Marianu, the dominant fighting force of Canaan, had a fair number of members amongst the king's companions as a personal guard and other were nobles of various ranks or lesser Marianu. Both chariot and dismounted Marianu are recorded in the army, and the title could be inherited, and they essentially paid a sort of Bronze Age feudal tax to the king, so they provided troops and agricultural tribute to the king, unless giving a special exemption. Muru was the generic term for officers of varying ranks, and unfortunately we don't have all of them fully translated, but one of the ranks was known as Chief of Thousand, and another, Akil Narkapti, was the Chief of Chariotry. Rashuti was the term given to higher ranking allied city states, vassals, and their troops, while another higher ranking term that we find is Sabu Najib or Markabati, and they could refer to fully equipped units or nobles. Na'arim was a term applied to veteran troops of both infantry and chariotry, the same Na'arim of Egyptian texts that saved them from defeat at the Battle of Kadesh. Mahar appears as a generic term for warriors, and here's an interesting fact. Maharbal. Doesn't this name sound familiar? The very same name that a famous Carthaginian army commander had was already in use, as it is attested in several scripts in the Bronze Age, so it's kind of interesting to see a name survive for over a thousand years. When it comes to mercenaries, we have evidence of Mesopotamians, Abiru, the Sea People, and even Kashkians, the people that gave the Hittites a huge headache serving in Ugarit armies. And last, and absolutely least, we have the terms Navu and Hupshu, which refer to nomadic herders and farmers, respectively, which would be levied to serve in Ugarit's armies. We have a lot of records of them frequently revolting because of poor pay and treatment, but you know, that's kind of to be expected. So essentially, the city-states and kingdoms were on average filthy rich, they were able to recruit a good amount of mercenaries, we would have peasant levies, and we would have extremely well-equipped elites when it comes to recorded troop types. And now we've seen the army equipment and military structure of the Canaanites. I hope you learned a thing or two, and if you didn't, well, I'm just gonna report you to the king, so what are you gonna do about it? As always, I really appreciate your support, any likes, shares and subscribing if you're crazy enough, it always just keeps me motivated to keep pumping out more historical content, just going through all my old university books, scientific documents and whatever you want to call it, it's just a lot of fun doing re-research. So more content is coming, what's next? Well, that's a surprise, you know, and until the next time...